G'day folks, we've got a good one for you today. We'd be hard pressed to find an individual whose life has been more committed to medtech innovation and who has blazed more trails for new technologies and therapies than Josh Macauer. From a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering at MIT, to an MD from NYU, to an MBA from Columbia University, Josh has the academic cred. He cut his teeth at Pfizer, then went on to become the quintessential entrepreneur, founding over eight medtech companies, ranging in application from minimally invasive vascular surgery to ENT to women's health. He also created an incubator, ExploraMed, to bring promising technologies to market and has been and is still a general partner at NEA Funding Innovation. As the incoming director of Stanford Biocenter for Biodesign, Josh comes full circle in his career having co-founded the program 20 years ago, to now taking the reins from the incomparable Paul Yock, and now leading it into the future. Join us today as we have a chat with Josh to discover the real person behind the genius, what drives his passion, and what made him who he is today. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks so much. You. Thanks really for taking the time. It. Thank you. Yeah. So let us know a little bit about your childhood. You know, yeah. Where'd you grow up? What was family like? Yeah. Um, well, I'm I'm the first of three uh, of a yeah, of three kids. I have a younger brother and sister, um, and uh, you know, great parents, very dedicated. Both of them teachers. Um, both uh, you know into science. My dad, earth science and astronomy, and you know, sort of uh, geologist. And my mom. Uh, biology and physiology. Uh, her, she had a degree in physiology, and they both taught high school. And so they, you know, our growing up was always, um, you know, this is before Google. Uh, <laughs> my parents were Google. You know, they always knew the answer, and um, you now they sort of always, you know, that that teaching bug um, obviously embedded deep. Um, so, you know, just a, a real love and appreciation for. Um, for science and for, you know, how things work and why things are, you know, mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, my, my childhood uh, was framed by them. And, uh, you know, it was a good, it was a good childhood. You know, I was a happy kid uh, and, uh, you know, liked getting involved in creative things and always sort of thinking about stuff and, uh, even even sort of quasi inventing early on. Oh, you know? already. Yeah. 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 I, I was really really inspired at you know sort of a single digit age by the six million dollar man, you know, <laughs> and uh, Steve Majors. just absolutely just um, the uh, that was just the idea that you know you could use technology to improve people's lives. I think that was sort of the initiation of my fascination with you know sort of what became my career direction yeah yeah siblings yeah, yeah. my yeah. brother they both my brother and sister both work at apple okay and um yeah they're both uh kind of in the software domain um uh, and um play play music with my brother um yeah we'll and, get to that one yeah yeah so yeah yeah, they're do, they're they're great and uh, they're local and so they actually you know my whole immediate family is local, which is nice. Yeah, that touches on family as well, and we'll yeah. we'll get to that yeah. one as mm -hmm. well. But uh, yeah, where where did you grow up? That oh, was, that was yeah, I was born in Massachusetts. Yeah, while my parents were finishing their graduate degrees at University of Massachusetts, and then we moved around a lot. You know, because they were high school teachers, we had a lot of. There were always budget cuts, and they were, you know, earlier in their careers, they were sort of uh, low on the totem pole. So they, they, you know, were constantly surfing jobs from place to place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that overall was a good experience for me because I always had to make new friends every all these places um, that we went. And uh, I remember like being in New York for a while and saying, "Well, when are we moving?" <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Yeah, that's uh, so. We wound up eventually landing in New City, New York, which is pretty much where my parents, you know, found long-term careers, and we we stayed from the age of eleven, you know, on through the time that they kind of moved out here. Once we were, once I was out here as an entrepreneur. 
Once you moved out here, have you have you stayed stable? I've always seen it seems interesting yeah. to me that if you move a lot as a kid with your parents, yeah. when you become an adult, when you yeah. become a parent, you you're stable. Yeah. Does that? I mean, we moved houses around here in this local area, but we have um, yeah, as you sold companies. <laughs> well, pretty much. I mean, yeah, we got what we could afford, you know, uh, incrementally. Uh, uh, but uh, but basically, yeah. I mean, we pretty much. I, I love this place. I mean, there's so much I love about the Bay Area. Um, it feels to me like the jazz era, where you know you got Dizzy Gillespie and. Louis Armstrong and, you know, um, so many great people who are all doing the same thing and all sort of a little competitive, but also very collaborative and like just mm. this whole like amazing energy and especially around med tech, like this is the place. I just felt like, wow, this is, uh, this is where it's all happening. So much is going on here. That's, uh, that is amazing. So many amazing people and just that, you know, you walk into a coffee shop and in New York, they're talking about, you know, sports or, you know, whatever. And you walk into a coffee shop here and they're talking about, you know, options and this or that startup and flying cars. It's just, I love the the innovative culture out here. Yeah, I love the jazz, the jazz analogy. That's, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going to see me using that for okay. now. <laughs> so a little difficult one, but you did mention your mother. And I yeah. know um, yes. you lost her recently. Yeah. She was very influential in Absolutely. your life. Totally Would you like to take the opportunity? Yeah, I'll try yeah. to get through it. Yeah. Um, she, uh, my mom was the most influential person in my life. Um, you know, it was interesting because I was at a dinner with Paul when he turned 60 and uh, he invited a few people to kind of like give him advice on how to do like the 60s, 70s thing. And people went around uh, the table talking about who was the, who was the most, which was, and it was like a, you know, dad or a coach or, you know, a, you know, sort of a, senior person in the army or whatever it was, all male, and came to me and I was like, it was my mom, you know, and that's really true. You know, she, uh, you know, she just taught me how to um, believe in myself. And, um, and I have, you know, interesting stories uh, about that and just sort of like uh, stand up to criticism, stand up to bullies. You know, my mom would tell the story about how she, punched a bully that was bullying her, uh, his, her brother in the, you know, and she came on and popped him in the nose and I was like, well, stay away from her. Uh, but she, uh, you know, she was a, just a people person, an animal person. She loved people. Um, and every, you know, just everyone loved my mom. And, um, but there was an interesting, you know, I had from an early age, cause I had a bunch of, you know, in, typical childhood injuries, but they were pretty traumatic. And I uh, got a fear of people with white coats, like oh, docs. Yeah. And I remember, um, you know, when we first moved into one of the one of the many moves in my early life, uh, moved to an elementary school, and you know they made me take a test. The person that was there was wearing a white coat. Totally free, couldn't remember my name. Uh, did not do the test well, and you know my and they came back and said, you know, this kid needs to be in a special class. Wow. And um, and they were serious. I mean, they were going to put me in a special a special class. And uh, my mom came in and was like, "No, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is not going to happen." And you know, she always you know she she always believed in me. Mm -hmm. And um, and even to the point where then multiple you know, and I'm I admittedly am sort of a, always got something going on in my head. You know, I was thinking and always sort of off on a thought. And when I'm in a thought, it's like. You know, people could be saying, Josh, Josh, you know, you know, like, where are you? But um, <clears throat> basically, um, one time, you know, the teacher had called my, my mom in to uh, say, hey, uh, your son is not paying attention. He's always daydreaming. He's off, you know, and she's, you know, typical my mom would be like, well, maybe what he's thinking about is more important than what's going on in this class. <laughs> That'd be my mom, you know, so, yeah. So she gave me that, that uh, ability to you know, sort of rise above criticism, rise above um, all that, you know, pay attention to it, but but to not let it impact your self-esteem. Self-worth. Self yeah, yeah. Self, yeah, yeah. So how do you balance, you know, a very hectic work schedule? You know, what, what, can, yeah. you, what can you teach folks? You know, I wish I was a good example. I, I, I try, uh, you know, I guess, and I don't, 
I'm not saying that I'm a good model of this because I have thrown myself into work and I do, I've done a lot. But, but what I would say uh, is that the time that I spend with my kids and family, it's like I'm all in. And, um, you know, I really want to be there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, so, you know, whether it's a weekend or it's vacations, it's like I try to really... You know, uh, if I'm going to work, I'm going to, everybody's going to be asleep and then I'll put yeah. on the laptop. But, um, you know, just try to make the, and you know, the truth is that I feel like that still works. Um, I somewhat don't feel totally satisfied by it, but I see how, you know, also I'm lucky because my wife is a great mom and she's always there for them. And so it's made up for my, um, you know, constantly being other places. So I think it's a team a team effort to raise kids and um you know they've done really well and i'm proud of them all um and i can take some small uh responsibility for that but you know the time that i've spent with them i really try to make it matter you know and make him and, and be there for them uh, when they need me and also in those moments and those those memories you know they're they, they cross over so yeah it's hard to be in between, so I sort of just, it's like I'm in the work, I'm working, and then I'm doing the weekends and, you know, vacations and stuff with the family. And yeah, I think that's, and that's the lesson, right? When you're there, you're there. Yeah, uh, right. And, and I think that's, you know, that's the best balance, it, yeah. you know, it appears we can make sometimes. Yeah. 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 All right, this <clears> one. <throat> uh, we also heard that your career could have gone in a different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have been hanging out with uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards <laughs> yeah. instead of Ed Bright and Paul York. Yes. <laughs> You're a musician. Right. You want to give us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, music um, has always been a big part of my life. My parents, of course, once again, are you know, very musical. We sang a lot and uh, learned various instruments over the years that I was a kid, ultimately landing on sort of guitar and bass and singing as my sort of foundation and played in bands very early. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> that's the second half to this yeah, question. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I don't want to get in front of the question, but no, go for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just, uh, there was a funny time, you know, we, my first, like one of my first bands that we were like literally <clears throat> 13, 14, you know, and, um, Really, I think the musicianship was really good. You know, at least that's what I thought. I mean, I, other people seem to think it. So anyway, we got actually got a gig at a local bar um, to play in a, in, a, in a jazz club. I was into, yeah, I had a reverse development. Like some people, like they, they start with the rock and roll and then they find jazz. Like I was like a jazz purist, you know, <laughs> like, um, you know, like uh, I had this, I had this like jacket that I love, like put like, and I like stenciled on jazz is, and people would go, jazz is what? It's like, if you have to ask, <laughs> if you have to ask, then you don't know. <laughs> you know? So it started young with you. Yes, it started young. <laughs> yes, it did. Um, but no, we would have to like, they would, we would play a set and then they'd be like, okay, outside, you know, couldn't stay in the bar because we were underage, yeah. you know, yeah. so we'd be out there in the cold, you know in between sets because uh, we were too young to be inside of a bar. At what time of night? This is, I'm oh, guessing no. this is late, right? Yeah, late at night. Yeah. Yeah, weekends, you know. So yeah. This does get back to your mom and your dad. They yeah. Were, they were pretty good. Yeah, yeah. No, they... they were they, they there? Were, or were you just... Uh, they can't... When, um, they would usually come to the performances. Um, <clears throat> but even early on, I mean, it was, you know... There was a lot of performances we did that they weren't there, but they, yeah, they were very supportive. You know, yeah. my dad, of course, you know, stuffing like cotton in his ears because it's always too loud for him. But you know, anyway, they they enjoyed it. You know, they were proud of us. <laughs> Just thinking of my 13 year old, I'm not sure I'd be trusting her in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your academic path is pretty yeah. impressive, right? Thanks. MIT, NYU, Columbia. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, I don't know. I I just wanted to. I've always you know, just want to understand. Um, and, um, you know, I went to, I transferred into MIT, um, uh, actually went to MIT because of my girlfriend at the time was MIT. So it was like a sort of silly reason to go to MIT, but I went there because of her, but then just discovered how much I love um, I discovered engineering before then, but it, it further reinforced, I loved MIT, MIT. 
is awesome. Um, everything was there. I just totally thrived there. It was a great education and um, loved engineering. And I love, I just love knowing and how things work and, and making things that work. You know, mm -hmm. it's just a real pleasure uh, to do that. And so that was like the fundamentals for me. Like I got way into what's called system dynamics and the, and understanding how fluid, electrical, thermal, um, mechanical systems basically are all bound by the same set of classical mechanical rules. It's fascinating and just amazing. So I loved it and um, that was the beginning. And then the question was next, what would I do next? And again, back to the six million dollar man, you know, how mm -hmm. am I going to learn how to make engineering work for for humans? And, you know, the choices were do a PhD or, or, or you know, graduate yeah. school or whatever. And I wanted to go to medical school because I think maybe similar to what ultimately like the biodesign sort of like going where the needs are. Like I felt like learning it from a doctor's perspective would actually help me understand what doctors actually deal with. And so I went to medical school for weird reasons, which are that I've wanted to learn about how to be a doctor so that I could make things for doctors, which uh, really put me in a weird, in, in a different place in medical school. Like I, you know, I was always like at the, you know, asking these questions, you know, well, so why is that? that way? And my colleagues were like, that's not on the test, Josh, you know, just <laughs> shut up, you know? I'm like, I know, but I need to know why, you know, <clears throat> so much memorization, which was hard for me because I'm not a memorizer, I'm a concept person, but, mm -hmm. but anyway, loved it, uh, loved physiology and anatomy and just, uh, you know, I just really love the human bodies and amazing, just, my first time into the OR and, you know, in a, and, and, you know, sort of open abdomen and, and observing the amazing intricate beauty and complexity of what is inside all of us and also how different it is yeah. one to the next person. And, you know, I think people, some people think that you, and I'm not really religious, but some people think that you, um, you know, you get into science and you become, you know, anti-religious, but actually there was, my experience to go through medical school was sort of like a spiritual one in the sense mm. that like you, mm. you just see this amazing system that is just so intricate and, and you just, it's hard to imagine how that just happens, you know, I mean, yeah. right. But, um, but I still, um, you know, obviously still very much a scientist, but I, I appreciate um, the beauty of the living things, you know? Yep. Yeah. And then MBA. And then MBA. So the goal there was, and I didn't do that until after working for a couple yep. of years, yep. but I realized sort of being at Pfizer, uh, which was sort of my big first big corporate job that I, there's a language I didn't understand and I didn't, and I couldn't participate really well in many of these conversations and was sort of you know categorized into a technical clinical person but yep. not a business person and i wanted to understand it and you know you know once again just like diving in i just like need to know this to be successful and i you know lots of great experiences there too and very formative um, and was very fortunate to have the support of my bosses to go um to executive uh executive program sure. for MBA. Yeah. Yeah. And so I worked through while I was doing the MBA in, at Columbia and it was fantastic. Great, great experience. It sounds very deliberate. Right? Yeah. I'm just thinking of my, you know, when I went to school. Yeah. I went because I thought, why not? That looks good. Yeah. But did, is this, you know, are you looking back? Yeah. Or that you really knew this coming forward? You knew that it, these are the things you're going to do? It does, you know, it's funny because like even just this last decision to like go to Stanford, it it's more it's not deliberate since I never planned it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm sure we had conversations before all this when Paul first started thinking about retiring. It's like, are you going to do that? And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, but things change, and you and suddenly the opportunity set and what you see as the future changes, and then it's just being opportunistic about well, okay. This is the right next step. So 
it was never planned out. Yeah. I was only doing what seemed to be the right thing to do next, honestly. And looking back, it looks very scripted, but actually, I mean, I'm very much sort of like eyes open, heads up, what happens next could define, you know, like what this conversation, something that we could change yeah. tomorrow. And I'm, I've always been that way. I have no routine really whatsoever. It's I funny. Just that just reminds me of when I was thinking about you know, the Fogarty opportunity. The yeah. first thought was no. And yeah. then, like, you know, a few months later, it was like, wow, no. There yeah. is tremendous opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We can't. We, this one, too. It seems like you were an Italian in another life. You, you, know, you have this <laughs> si. love of all things Italian. Si. Grazie mille. Yeah, I think, I think as part of this question, Margaret wanted me to actually ask you a question in Italian, but si. no, no, I can't. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, was it true that you that you you learnt uh, Italian to give a presentation? Well, first of all, I love it. I love the Italian culture. Um, it's a friendly, warm, family loving, life loving, food and wine loving culture, and I love that. Um, one of my idols early on that I learned about as a kid that I just, uh, <laughs> you know, really appreciated was uh, Leonardo da Vinci and, um, you know, artist and, you know, inventor and, you know, um, scientist and all this kind of, you know, so like, I was like, wow, this is like awesome guy, you know, that I totally uh, appreciated. And, um, and so that was some inspiration. But I think the real, um, I think what drew me in probably started with the food and wine, you know, and um, I, and business travels. I, I yeah. did not grow up with any means. My parents were teachers, you know, at the end of the summer, we, they were literally be scraping together the coins from and figuring out whether we can have pizza or macaroni <laughs> and cheese for the remainder of the last couple of weeks before they start to get a paycheck again. I mean, it, you know, so. There was no fancy wines in my house growing up. Um, but, you know, of course. I'm very happy there are now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, my kids are getting a whole different experience. Um, but uh, but the uh, first exposure to all this was uh, through business trips. And I had a Gaia Barbaresco that blew my mind. And I was like, oh my God, you know. This is amazing. This is so much better than Bartles and James wine coolers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that just drew me in. And, and I wrote to Guy, I'd never seen the bottle before. Uh, I wrote to Angelo Gaia um, and said, you know, okay, this is amazing. Where, where can I find your wine here in the United States? And he pointed me to this wine person. Um, and uh, that turned out to be Flory um, Kennedy. And She's still part of my life today, but anyway, so she's educated me all about Italian wines. And then through all that education, I started to want to travel more and be in Italy. And then of course the food and the people, and then you just get drawn in and fall in love with it. So I do love Italy. My family goes back every other year. Yeah. I've designed my house around an Italian theme. Um, you know, I just, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the Italians were, sort of the creators of, um, one of the creators of, of our sure. modern culture, yeah. you know, so much of our food and architecture and, you know, I mean, they, they really, you know, the Romans, you know, define so much of the technology of today, um, that, uh, we don't even realize, you know, now, you know, how it's evolved, but anyway, yeah, I appreciate the innovation of the Italian origins, you know, so. Love it. That's no, good it, yeah. to see. And I think I know maybe we get NEA to invest in this Italian company. I'm on the board of it. Yeah. We can, we'll spend some more time exactly. over there. Exactly. Right? I'm looking for a business opportunity to be in Italy. <laughs> okay. Done. You'll get a telephone call. Hope you enjoyed that episode. There's so much more to learn. So please join me for the second segment as we explore more of Josh's contributions to the medtech world.